Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Um, it is a true, true honor to be here with all of you. Um, this is indeed a very exciting, uh, not only topic, but also panel. I think that um, there is a lot of um, misconceptions, misinterpretations, um, sometimes confusion about this um, terminology of you know, decoloniality, decolonization. So what does it mean and what is the relation of that with design? So um, I am going to actually share my screen because we have a few um, slides for you. There we go. Um, and basically, I am going to tell everyone um, a little bit about what this uh, panel is intending to do, what we are really trying to um, address today. And uh, some of the um, topics that, you know, deal with this um, specific uh, field of study, let's just say, um, are going to be addressed by our panelists who are um, Ahmed Ansari, Leslie Angnall, and Sadie Redwing. Um, Ahmed is an in industry assistant professor of integrated digital media. Uh, at New York University. Leslie Anno is an associate director of design, um, design thinking for social impact at Tulane University. And Sadie Redwing um, is a student uh, success, su success coach um, at the American Indian College Fund. Um, I am Gabby Hernandez. I am an assistant professor of graphic design at the University of Florida. And I am a member of both the Design Educators uh, Steering Committee and the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Task Force of AIGA. And today we are, um, we have the honor to be sharing the moderation with one of our incredible MFA in design and visual communication students, Samira Shiri Devik. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about our audience. And well, up to this morning, we had over 1,100 registered attendees, which is amazing. And um, during this panel, uh, we're going to have, as uh, Lisa said, some um, of the comments, the discussions happening in the Zoom chat. And after the panel, we are going to continue the discussion on the Slack um, channel called Day 2 Research. So before um, I allow the panelists to um, you know, talk a little bit about their work and, you know, their philosophy around this topic. I want to give you a little bit of a framework um, for this discussion. Um, author Arturo Escobar, in his book, Design for the Pluriverse, establishes that the critical role that design can have in transition into a world of many centers um, in challenging patriarchal Western capitalist views of modernity. He also exposes uh, the practical potential of design to contribute to profound cultural and ecological transitions. Uh, and he calls for autonomous design systems for local and community-based statement, nourishing differences. Uh, Walter Vignolo refers to the coloniality as epistemic disobedience. And Brenda Laurel establishes that when one steps back from the marketplace, things can be seen in a different light. While time passes on the surface, we may dive down to a calmer, more fundamental place. So it is my hope that today's discussion is going to help us take that stance and think a little bit deeper about what we do, the impact, uh, the root of everything that we do. So with this whole topic, uh, we tend to think, okay, so how is this framework applicable to the work that we do in studios and design classrooms? So this panel was actually born from the need to bring these kinds of philosophical discussions to the forefront um, and how they can be implemented, how we can get involved, how do we start talking about these topics. And, uh, you know, the coloniality and the colonial design has become to some, de some degree a buzzword. So what are the misconceptions? What are things that people tend to um, confuse at this uh, term or this uh, field of study with other um, similar things that may be informing one another but not are not quite the same. So I am going to start with um, Ahmed and um, I am very proud to um, have him here because his work is, is one that I have been looking after for a, a long time 
and uh, he's an assistant professor at NYU Tandon in the Department of Technology, Culture, and Society. He has a PhD in Design Studies for Carnegie Mellon University, and his research focuses on decolonization, decolonizing the production of knowledge in design practice, practice and scholarship, as well as thinking through local cosmologies as the basis for new paradigms in the development of artificial infrastructures and technology. So I'm going to allow him to um, talk a little bit more about the decolonizing design platform and some other work. Uh, thank you, Gabby. Uh, you know, just before, uh, how much time do we each have for these introductions? Just to sure. Maybe five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, uh, you know, thank you for having me here. And, and also, you know, it's, it's looking to be a great audience, uh, a great audience from all around the world. Um, you know, my, my research, I guess I can speak to a little bit uh, about what my sort of focus is. Um, you know, I mostly look at the sort of grounds by which designers, on which designers produce knowledge, right? So a great deal of, of what I look at personally in my own research is looking at how designers do research and how they construct knowledge about the world. Um, and, and I do this uh, precisely by the way that I problematize and contextualize a lot of what designers do when they're doing, for example, ethnography and field research or historical research, archival research, is, is looking at how, um, what kinds of grounds you are proceeding from. So what definitional and conceptual, what we would call ontological grounds and epistemological grounds you are proceeding from informs the way that you situate and construct knowledge of others, right? And this would be, this would include uh, other cultures, communities that belong to worlds that are, that, that is not the world you belong to. Um, and so that's a part of my research and that, you know, just to kind of elaborate on the statement, the short statement that I provided here. And then the other thing um, that I'm very interested in, in, and, you know, my focus tends to lie on the sort of context of, and the histories of South Asia uh, is, is how we can use local histories, uh, local knowledge systems, local conceptions, philosophical systems, um, especially thought around design, technology, aesthetics, craft. I was very interested in researching, doing research on gift economies and the idea of the gift in the South Asian context, how we can use these to come up with and derive new ways of thinking about both current and emerging technologies and technological paradigms and infrastructure, infrastructures. Um, and so, you know, uh, to, to, to talk maybe a little bit um, about an example, we were asked to provide examples of our work. The most recent, so I, I thought I'd provide the most recent example and this is something, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that um, I think this is also, it's been a very fruitful summer for me um, because I ended up teaching, um, offering this um, online seminar. Uh, it's free and open to the public and we've had lots of people coming in. It was a seminar that was kind of sparked um, uh, by this kind of moment in the U.S. and throughout the world, you know, there's been a confluence of things. People are staying at home. Uh, I imagine that they have, you know, most of the seminars and symposiums that we're attending are online now. Um, and I thought that it would be fruitful at this time to offer um, an educational course delving into various things, um, trying to understand how the modern world or world system came to sort of be. So trying to understand the coloniality of power, trying to understand uh, epistemic uh, colonial, colonization, colonialism, um, and many other things um, through a course that delves into history, that draws from ethnographic work, empirical work, that draws, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a course that draws from many different disciplines, philosophy, as well as, of course, post-colonial theory, uh, you know, decolonial scholarship, post-colonial scholarship, and so on and so forth. 
and this has been a, it's a, it's been a great course and a very challenging course to teach as well as to learn from. Uh, you know, uh, teaching is also learning, and I've been you know very uh, most of the discussions. In fact, all the discussions that we have Saturdays are what I look forward to, honestly, um, because the discussions that we have are you know very thought provoking. Um, it's been a cause for great self-reflection, um, and it's been a cause for many of us, uh, including myself, to think through and think with each other. Um, and so, in a way, what we're also doing when we're when we're teaching and learning is we're co-producing knowledge, right? We are co-constructing knowledge, and we are sharing knowledge. And so, yeah, uh, you know, it's. I thought that I throw that in as, as one of the more recent things that I've done. And it's, a, it's an amazing it's example of, of the importance of building knowledge together, right? And you said it's free, the fact that, you know, you get really to exchange so many ideas with people, um, you know, in a, in a free form, in a free platform, um, that itself allows people to have access to the topic and the discussion a lot more, right? So, yeah. All right. Thanks uh, so much for that. Thank Ahmed. you. Um, I am going to now um, tell you a little bit about Leslie Ann Noll. Um, she is the Associate Director of Design Thinking for Social Impact of Tulane University. Uh, she practices design through emancipatory and critical lenses, focusing on equity, social justice, and the experience of people who are often excluded from design research. She uh, created a very interesting tool called the Designer's Critical Alphabet. Um, so I'm going to now pass it to Leslie so that maybe she can talk about a little bit um, this, this tool and some other work that she's, that she's done and doing. Okay, thank you, Gabby. Um, so and I'll start with decoloniality or decolonization, like from my point of view, you know, as people will probably hear. I don't have a, an American accent. Um, I'm from uh, Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean. Actually, even before I say that, I should say I've joined, um, I've set aside some of my Saturdays for uh, Ahmed's class as well. There was a weekend I was planning to travel. I was like, no, I can't go anywhere because I'll miss the class. Um, I'm really a look. I just sit in the background and I listen, but I enjoy those conversations. Um, so I am from a country that was a colony. Um, you know, our colonial past is pretty recent. So, you know, decolonization to me is probably going to be different to um, decolonization to Ahmed or to Sadi. Um, and it's like a constant theme in the work that I do where I'm trying to think of um, the way, the, the power structures that exist because of colonization and then how do I respond to those power um, structures, possibly by shifting them? Um, I have to, you know, when we talk about decolonization in Trinidad, we also talk, and, and not just in Trinidad, but you know, there's also something that happens in our minds that we have to unlearn, you know, where we have to um, start to think about why do we feel self-conscious about X, you know, is it because of some colonial message that we were getting? And then how do we undo that type of learning that we that we had? And so that's the that I suppose informs the way that I feel about decoloniality and um, the work that I do, which I'm trying to do th through this lens. Um, whether or not this lens is relevant in America might be another. Um, question or discussion, but that is the lens that I'm taking in the work that I do. Um, let's see. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about the alphabet, and then I'll tell you about Pivot and the Pluriversal Design Special Interest Group. So um, I designed this um, thing that I call a designer's critical alphabet, which really was, you know, my design education was not what I consider critical education. It was, I did industrial design, and we were learning how to make things and how to make beautiful things. And we were never talking about society or critical race theory or anything like that. And so um, really the alphabet that I created was like as a response to 
me being an outsider, um, I spent a year in California. And so I had a lot of conversations during that year where I really felt my outsiderness in a way that I had never felt it before. And I kept writing, you know, I kept looking for language to um, support some of the things that I wanted to say. And then as I found the term, I was writing them down. And then eventually I started to see, oh, okay, this is starting to look like an alphabet. Um, and so, the, so I compiled what I thought was, I guess, most interesting. Um, and then I had to force fit a few let letters because I couldn't find things to fit into them. And the alphabet is just to, um, to have people to start thinking about how can we use critical theory in design, okay? Um, so the, I'm, I'm the co-chair of the Pluriversal Design Special Interest Group of the Design Research Society. And our focus is really on um, really sharing um, or really creating a space for very plural discussions around design. Um, we are very interested in practice that happens outside of Europe and North America. We have very inten intentional um, conversations, not regularly, but periodically, um, where we're trying to um, create a space where people feel comfortable sharing uh, diverse epistemologies. Um, and this grew out of my experience, my colleague Renata's experience, um, and some other people who were in the founding um, committee. It grew out of our anxiety when we went to conferences and we would walk I'll speak from, in my, from my perspective, I would walk from room to room to room in a conference and not find things that were interesting to me. And I was realizing that maybe the, the epistemological starting point is just very different. So like if I walk into a Latin American room, I'm like, oh, I understand what people here are talking about. Our epistemologies are, are more similar. We are more interested in you know, some of these same ideas. And so we started to create these conversations. So this year we hosted um, a conference called Pivot, which was designing a world, um, the, it's Pivot 2020, designing a world of many centers, where we intentionally found um, designers um, in, India, um, South America, we had a case study from um, Bots Botswana, I believe something from Kenya as well. And we really intentionally then um, found people to share their design experience and their design work with us. Um, and that's the philosophy of this group, you know, that we are trying to create a, a, um, a space for very plural um, discussions um, where people are able to share their different ways of work rather than people trying to come into somebody else's way of doing design. All right? So I think it's um, when we talk about design from many different centers, um, we start to hear design being, you know, we start to hear different possibilities of design. Um, I'm not a theorist, I'm a practitioner, but I read a lot of theory. And, you know, I, what I've seen, an, an interesting idea I've seen often in the theory is that it's like we need a new language for design and that new language can't come from old epistemology. And so, you know, I get energized when I'm talking to other designers from, um, the global south like me <laughs> you know that I, I start to hear language that um that i think you know language and ideas that are compatible with the way that i want to practice design so i've said a lot um just two things you know i like to read mignolo and walsh i like to read um i'm really searching also for different i mean not different i'm like i said i'm not a theorist other people know these authors, but I'm in love with Boaventura de Souza Santos. Um, and I recently found um, this other author, Ugarte. So I'm always looking to see, okay, what are the Caribbean scholars saying? What are African scholars? What are Latin American scholars um, saying? And what are Asian scholars saying? So that's my perspective. on it. Thank you so much, Leslie, uh, definitely. And I want everybody to know that um, the recommended readings of our panelists will be shared in the Slack channel as well for day two. So, um, you know, this is not going to be lost in, in, in time uh, after, after now. Okay, so our third panelist is uh, Sadie Redwing. She is a Lakota graphic designer and advocate of the Spirit Lake Dakota Nation. 
She has a BFA in New Media Arts and Interactive Design at the Institute of American Indian Arts. And she has a Master's of Graphic Design from NC State University in North Carolina. And her research on cultural, cultural revitalization through design tools and strategies created a new demand for uh, tribal competence in graphic design research. So I am going to now um, bring in Sadie so that she can talk a little bit more about her work. There are really interesting uh, images of her work coming up. So um, Sadie. Hey, everybody. Um, so again, my name is Sadie Redwing. I'm a citizen of the Spirit Lake Dakota Nation out of Fort Taunton, North Dakota. Currently, I'm a student success coach at the American Indian College Fund, which is located in Denver, Colorado. Um, and kind of the perspective I'm bringing into this conversation is kind of more of how indigeneity looks like within the realm of design research, specifically with this focus on the term decolonization. A lot of my work and research and where my voice is lies on decolonization first before the decolonialism and specific to the definition of the occupants of land, the occupants of space, um, and specifically talking about land, space, environment, um, sovereignty within the United States. So bringing in a perspective of what decolonization looks like within America, specifically United States of America. Um, so just kind of uh, quickly, I, um, I started, um, I would say I would start my journey within design research with my experience at the Standing Rock um, fight against the Dakota Access Pipeline and understanding how, or how should I say, the understanding of lack of represent, visual representation for sovereign nations within the United States, specific to the Lakota nations of the North Dakota and South Dakota territories. And um, following my time at the protest, I did not necessarily see myself within uh, um, teaching environments, but kind of got, uh, um, was able to bring my two passions into one. One, advocating for um, the survival of indigenous symbolism within the United States, specific to the Great Plains um, regions of, um, you know, tribal visual alphabets or languages, and then also to um, incorporating um, an indigenous perspective in higher education spaces. Um, which having those two motivators in me, um, I was able to, you know, find myself teaching at the University of Redlands, which I was able to share um, two uh, courses introduced into a small private college, one of them being um, Indigenous Perspective and Visual Communication, so what does that look like? And then intro to this term, Visual Sovereignty. Um, I know we'll have a discussion to kind of talk about this definition of uh, sovereignty in this conversation of decolonization, but just to kind of give people an idea who may be unfamiliar with the term, is providing visual representation of a nation that is sovereign in the United States. So this is a nation that has a government that is inside the United States, but does not follow the United States government. And with that, each of those nations need designers, um, but in order to uh, represent sovereignty, how are tribes doing that? And I guess kind of an idea um, assignment from that class, what would that look like is, you know, we have all these sovereign nations, which should be, if our treaties are recognized, they should be acknowledged as actual many countries in the United States. And if that was a fact, any of these many nations could enter into, let's say, the FIFA World Cup. So I always, you know, just kind of a sample assignment, you know, ask my students, what would the Cherokee Nation look like if they were participating in the FIFA World Cup or the Seminole Nation or the Lakota Nation? Um, and to kind of give an idea of like, what would their jerseys look like? How would they, you know, what would their tribal flags look like? So kind of bringing this idea of designing for a demographic that has a unique visual language that ties to a, a form of communication existent um, before colonial contact. Now following uh, teaching at the University of Redlands, I'm now finding myself in, in, um, as an advocate at the American Indian College Fund and making sure tribal colleges and mainstream colleges offer the resources Native American students need within um, within higher education and one area that's lacking is in design um, education. So kind of, you know, trying to um, be participating in building curriculum. So if you want to talk about visual sovereignty, you want to revive, uh, you know, indigenous visual uh, visual languages and the resources aren't in the in the uh, 
modern design texts, or where can you find those? Or how would you, um, how would you revive a language that's so dependent on land when, um, you know, the resource may not be there anymore? Um, the graphic that Gabby is showing right now is, um, is an image of a, of a sketch of a conversation that's coming out of this project. I'm working with this, uh, this uh, book publishing company called Hyphen Reads. Um, a woman, uh, her name is Heather Lim, and she owns a book publishing company out of um, New Jersey, and she brought this conversation to my attention. Her um, of Korean descent said that when she came to the United States to do her graduate um, studies, she, uh, she was unaware that there was indigenous people alive in the United States, which is a real uh, reality check for myself or just to have that understanding. But she said one of the reasons why is because there's no text in uh, Korea that explains, um, you know, the culture of indigenous people here. So one project she's doing is her father is publishing books that she is translating and she's translating works of Native American authors. And uh, we're bringing um, in one, and she's going region. So, so within, so the authors that come from the Great Plains area, um, we're talking about how can we either brand or kind of show some visual language that reference where these authors are coming from, especially if they're bringing ideas and languages that root to that specific region. So this uh, this work that Gabby is showing is part of a um, it's part of a conversation of how if this this quote the buffalo nation will rise again if this is a common quote that we use within native america academia how is that shown and how is that shown in various forms so kind of given an idea of how can you represent this quote specific to higher education in many forms or how should i say tropes multi-generational tropes so we got uh symbols in here that have been used before european contact we got symbols used symbols and icons or um graphics used once contact was made i'm going to say within the 1800s then we got the icons um you know from uh you know kind of that we use currently and then also bringing this idea of text um, and I don't have the time to kind of go through the whole thing, but to kind of give you ideas when you're when we're trying to bring some of these ideas to life um, that speak to a specific indigenous demographic within the United States, um, they're going to look a little they're going to look a little bit more artistic and um, you know geometric and pattern related, but it's a way of recording an idea and to provide greater examples, a lot of the work that I'll do, if you'll see within you know, the website or social media, a lot of that visual representation speaks to a Great Plains different demographic and trying to visually show um, ideas of, of um, terms or motivations or um, ambitions of uh, uh, quotes that we would use in educational spaces for Native American students. Thank you so much, Sadie. Um, I think that what you're describing right now could be a good beginning to a 10 minute discussion that we can have before we start bringing in um, Samira's notes on the chat. Um, and one of those things that, you know, is prevalent in the discussion and um, I think maybe a good way to start is thinking about, you know, the differences uh, between terms like decolonization, decolonialism, decoloniality. Uh, Sadie um, pointed out um, when we, when I asked her to, you know, provide some of this information that sometimes people tend to translate decolonization as anti-capitalism. So I'll, I want to open this up to the three of you to just to hear your points of view about this terminology and uh, we have several other points, but we'll try to go one by one and see how much uh, we can we can discuss for the next 10 minutes. So um, I don't know what you all want to to say about, you know, terminology and um, how we understand that. Yeah, I guess just to kind of um, just kind of reference, you know, just reiterating like I really um, I take the word decolonization really literal, um, just really defining um, you know, the occupying of space and understanding that anytime you're talking about space or land or re referencing decolonization with America, 
you have to, you know, talk about, you know, tribal territories, or you have to be referencing the indigenous population or those design methods. But what's unfortunate is that within design education, a lot of that information isn't in that realm. It's either in a realm of, um, you know, ancient American art, it's in the realm of museums, it's in the realm of anthropology, archaeology. So they're missing a lot of the information on design methods that could be useful, especially when thinking about where um, future trends and technology are going, especially in the means of, um, you know, let's say revitalizing animal populations or land resources. Um, there's a lot of traditional ecological knowledge or TEK that can, can be used within, you know, some of these methods that a lot of designers talk about. So I think, um, you know, kind of seeing the two quotes here, I see this, uh, this term more um, as a way of um, bringing some of those methods back that are rooted from specific regions, specific to the plains, specific to the desert, the coastal areas, the Antarctic, and each of those areas have rich knowledge that could be used in design. So I think about it as, um, so I'm, 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 from a place where I think we have been colonized mentally. So, you know, for me, the decolonization process is a form of unlearning. Um, I found a quote recently that talks about the liberation of knowledge through, um, through the diversity of conversations. And so that's, um, the process that I'm very interested in the decolonization. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's the angle that I'm taking when I, I'm talking about it. And that is, um, you know, Trinidad is not considered Latin America, but at the end of the day, okay, I am from, let's say, Trinidad is in the middle of Latin America. So, you know, I'm, so what I read in Latin American decolonial theory um, is very similar to, um, the point it, it's it's the point of view that I'm very interested in you know where we're talking about as I said liberation of knowledge um, really removing the Eurocentrism in our societies which are no longer um, maybe European you know we, we no longer have European colonization but the way we think is still Eurocentric and so I think that that's where the decolonization process is coming in my work um and then i i know we're going to talk about this somewhere else but that is why in some cases um what i do looks like it is dei work um because i'm thinking of things like eurocentrism and but it's actually a slightly different process for me Uh, so, you know, I would, I would, um, you know, sort of double down on what Leslie said uh, about, uh, you know, decolonial practice, praxis as well as scholarship, um, varies immensely depending on who, who you are speaking for, um, who you are speaking of, where you are speaking from, uh, and for. Uh, it varies across uh, space and time because, again, the concerns of communities vary across space and time, and it varies across contexts, cultures, cosmologies, and so on and so forth. So it fundamentally, it does mean different things depending on where, you know, what it, so for, for one community, while it might mean sovereignty and autonomy, for another, it might mean delinking from Eurocentricity, uh, you know, there might, there, not that these things, uh, the valence of them might shift, right, depending on where you are. And this, this, the one thing that I would add to that is that even the valence of these things changes within communities, societies, and cultures themselves. Like, for example, I mean, I focus on South Asia, but South Asia in itself is a very heterogeneous multiple plural landscape with many conflicting visions of the future by many different communities with different histories and different experiences 
of colonialism, right? Uh, so whether if if for example you are an Adivasi, one of the indigenous peoples of India, you know, decolonization means the valences shift and it begins to mean something politically very different, as opposed to say if you are an urban middle class, uh, upper caste. Uh, you know, individual living in the city who's had an in education in English, right? Has largely had an education in mm -hmm. English. Yeah, that changed. Uh, and has had an Anglo-Eurocentric education. International um, as to as to the differences between the sort of terminologies, I mean, uh, you know, like this is more of a historical fact, right? But a lot of the people that we read uh, that that come under decolon that fall under decolonial literature. We're not using the word decolonial or the word coloniality of power or epistemic uh, disobedience or any of those or delinking or any of those terms, right? They were talking about decolonization, but people like Franz Fanon are still part of that genealogy of scholarship. Um, and so, you know, uh, the for me at least, the terms, um, depending on the context that they are used in, one can use decolonization if you are referring to scholarship that is actually talking about coloniality and decoloniality. Um, so, so yeah, I guess that, that was my two bits, but uh, yes. Another thing that um, a lot of people think about when it comes to this topic is, how do I do decolonial design, right? How do I, I've heard many, many times people saying, how do I decolonize my syllabus? How do I decolonize my class? So um you know there is really no step by step and i agree completely with um ahmed in that regard and and, and leslie ann uh just for another couple of minutes what do you have to say about that specifically when people think that this is a step-by-step -step kind of process i'm gonna go all out there and say that okay if we start to say that these are there is a step-by-step -step process to me, you know, as it's there on this on the slide, I think that this is kind of us falling back into that bin binary kind of, you must do this, then that, then that. And that's not the way, you know, if we're talking about plurality and, um, you know, multiple um, or plural discourses, we, we wouldn't have one way of doing this. Um, I could suggest one or two things. You know, one thing is to see, I sound like a stuck record, but how do you um, unlearn Eurocentrism? And so that for me is something that's really important in the decolonial work that I'm trying to do. You know, um, and you know, even as a non-white person, you know, I have to I have to unlearn this. And so perhaps that becomes part of it, or perhaps, you know, I think in design, um, we, you know, like when it was the last year, I think was the, the hundred years, hundred year anniversary of the Bauhaus. And I started this tweet, like, don't tell me anything about the anniversary of the Bauhaus. I really don't want to know this, you know? And it's, it's really, the question is, how are you going to bring in um, some many more diverse discourses into your design work? So that would be my challenge to other people. All right, so um, we have a few other, um, you know, topics that are, you know, very prevalent out there in conversations. Um, Ahmed also told us about um, there is no such thing about decolonial or decolonizing design, right? We can talk about this a little bit later. Um, and, you know, one thing that I, I think is important for, for us to understand in this topic is that we we need to see the traditional canon as one thing that belongs to one context right not as the absolute truth which has been you know presented to us for many decades um things that we still teach in our schools so um you know i think that i definitely agree with leslie in that in that sense unlearning is definitely a part of a process of decolonization. So I don't see um, the chat right now, but I would like to bring in Samira, um, see if we can bring in one or two questions or comments from people. 
Yes, I have a couple couple of questions here. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, this can be for Leslie. It mm -hmm. is fair to say that decolonization refers to add diversity or theoretical models and frameworks to graphic design. Is this a case? Okay. Can you repeat the question? Yes, and also I can share it on chat again. Mm -hmm. You said that this was after oh. um, Sadie's? Uh, I said it can be for Leslie. Oh, okay. Is it fair to say that decolonization refers to add diversity or theoretical models and frameworks to graphic design? So for me, it's not just about adding diversity um, because the idea for, to me of adding diversity still means that we have like this um, we're still assuming that there's a dominant narrative and we're just going to add a little bit of seasoning to this dominant narrative. And my question would be, how are we um, making the conversation a little bit more, um, more distributed so it's not just, oh, here's the, the Native American 30-minute class in the, in the semester. It's like, how are we bringing in more plural perspectives? Mm -hmm. Maybe Ahmed and Sadie might have something. Um, yeah, well, I can enact what you're saying can kind of go on the points of the couple slides that Gabby um, was going into and talking about. Um, <clears throat> I, pr I propose and use a couple of questions. I've been in a conversation with Professor Bailey at uh, North Carolina State, and we're, we've been having this conversation of, um, you know, generally when um, folks ask, you know, well, how can me as a non-Indigenous designer help, um, you know, um, to provide more inclusivity with it, whether it be within a curriculum, a project, a team, you name it. Um, and two things that I have to put in context that kind of relate to these two questions I propose. Um, one conversation or that's coming out is how are schools training students to design for the 576 sovereign nations? So this kind of relates to my advocacy at the American Indian College Fund. Um, there are 35 tribal colleges within the United States, and it's unfortunate we don't have 576 tribal colleges, so each of those sovereign nations does have their own college, and of those 35 colleges, there you cannot get a degree in design. So um, one, uh, one conversation or a lifetime project is, well, if you were to develop an indigenous design institution, what is that going to look like? And um, a lot of that is kind of kind of go into this question and within the next slide is, you know, what are these pre colonial methods that are going to be brought into this curriculum and just to kind of just kind of give some quick general ideas is, you know, well, as a sovereign nation, how can you function, you need your own fire department, you need your own government, you need your own clinics, you need your own school, and if you want to revive a tribal language a lot of those words have been existed before contact. So if I'm in a position where I want to create an app, I want to create a dictionary, um, and there's a lot of words I have to bring to life, but I can't see it because either, you know, land was bought, land was destroyed, um, you know, that's tough. Um, then we have to kind of go look into a his historical um, context. Let's say that um, a lot of these na nations want to have their own currency. Well, is the United States going to accept some of the currency? And if we had a designer to design what that currency is going to look like, um, you know, wh what, what would entail it so that the Lakota currency would be different than the Navajo currency? Or even, you know, for some of, some of the issues that we're dealing with now, you know, kind of related to COVID is how can our own nations, you know, provide protection um, within our communities. And as a designer, where do you fall? Where do you fall in that? Or as an inventor or as um, somebody who um, is able to develop an infrastructure that promotes, you know, healthier living. Um, so kind of going into that next question, you know, what what is a, um, a pre- uh, you know, pre-colonial uh, model, um, and if you're kind of looking at design, not in a visual aspect, but let's say designing a community, you know, how, how was community design, how was society designed, um, and it was functioning, and, you know, we'll throw out uh, uh, 
you know, examples of like trade routes, examples of um, inventions that were used to provide performance, but it's unfortunate that a lot of that was, was gone and it just would be nice to be in a position to have resources that demonstrate, I've seen some questions in the chat as well, what does, where, where can I find indigenous, uh, indigenous um, design methods? Well, as I mentioned, they're not gonna be, you have to dig for them, you have to search with them, you have to go to the communities, you have to go to the reservations or the sovereign nations. Um, but just to know that it is difficult and it's a challenge to show some of these methods because we're, um, we, lo we lost a lot of them. And, but some areas of research to start mo moving forward is, you know, how did regionally, so looking at the grasslands, looking at the desert, you know, looking at the coastal areas, the way community was designed was based on the, those areas of protection, based on the animals that um, were there based on, you know, the weather patterns or how the star, you know, looking at um, astrology and getting this idea of, well, what methods do you pull from those TEK, those traditional ecological knowledges, do you pull into a design that's functioning, whether it be visual um, or whether it be within technology, whether it be within infrastructure design, whether it be, you know, adornment, like you name it. It's just a matter of, um, how can we start training these students who have to go back to a tribal nation? And how are we teaching them to design for that tribal nation? And it's unfortunate that we don't have the schools or the curriculum to do it. So to kind of answer, you know, well, how can you decolonize the syllabus? Well, how can you get these students to go back to train, to design for a demographic that um, doesn't function in the US government? It functions within their own tribal government. And it's a little bit exhausting to have to learn 576, but we have to start somewhere. Thank you so much, uh, Sadie. So Samira, um, why don't you bring in another one of the questions? I have a question that is the colonial design a process or a state? And how do you know when you get there? Hmm. Maybe Ahmed, you want to address that one? Yeah, I mean, you know, and this is kind of also related to my observation, perhaps the, the provocation that there is no such thing as decolonizing design. What does that mean? Um, first of all, you know, decolonization is a continuous historical process that acts at many, many scales, is different for different communities, and is contingent also on, uh, you know, the, the way that the present unfolds and the past realizes itself through the present. So it is a historically contingent process, and therefore it is a continuous process. This, there, you know, there is this tendency in designers, you know, to think of, it's very easy for us to think about, you know, I follow a series of steps. I'm, I'm imagining an ideal condition. This is like Herb Simon's sort of definition of design, right? You have an existing condition, you envision an ideal condition, and then you follow a step-by-step -step process to arrive at a preferred condition, right? And this is not that at all, right? In fact, it's, it's the very thing that we have to resist, um, uh, you know? Uh, there is no, there is no um, perfect uh, ideal out there in the platonic ether, you know, that we are sort of like aiming to materialize. Um, and the, the, the other thing um, that I would have to say, and this kind of goes to the earlier question, the, the question that we just, just to add to also what Leslie and, and Sadie had to say too. I mean, the way that I think about this is, is there are two things. Firstly, um, design designs, and this I'm taking from, you know, Tony Fry and Anne-Marie Willis's formulation of anything that you design does things out there in the world. Design anything, what you are actually doing when you design an artifact, whether it's a communication design piece or an industrial or interactions or whatever it happens, what you are actually doing is you are redesigning or designing ways for people to act in and relate to their reality. So that you are redesigning their relation to reality by designing the material world or the artificial. 
Um, and if you buy that, uh, then, then there is this question, right, which becomes very apparent in history, uh, which is, uh, why is it, you know, like, if, if we look, if we think about from, from the ontological difference, right, the different cultures, different communities, different civilizations throughout history have different, engender and embody different relations to reality itself, different relations to their bodies, to the, 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 to nature and the physical world, to their environments, to other people, to their relations. Then, you know, this talk of diversity, diversity without engendering different relations to reality and simply regurgitating Anglo-Eurocentric relations to reality is not really decolonization, right? And if you believe in a pluriverse, then the work is never ending because you are continuously, ontological differentiation is a never ending process. It's a historical process. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't know if that completely gets to the heart of, of the question, but that's just my We're, we're trying, we're yeah. trying to get there. <laughs> And I Thank also want to jump yeah. in and add to, um, well, I don't know if I'm adding to what Ahmed is saying, but I think it's tied. I saw something fly by in the chat, you know, where people were talking about decolonization versus mod modernity, or are we trying to go back to pre-Columbian, um, whatever. And actually, I think that all of that is, um, you know, that's, that's not for me, um, the, the way we're thinking about this, you know, I think I, I want to say it's not correct and I don't want to say it's, it's not correct because I don't want to, I don't like to talk like that. But it's that um, we just have to recognize that we all have different types of modernities that we're living in. So, um, you know, it's 2020 everywhere in the world and people are going to be in that 2020 in different ways, you know. So, I mean, if I'm talking about decolonization, it's not that, okay, I'm trying to go back to Africa or I'm trying to, it's that I want the space to have my own 2020 experience that is not determined by um, this previous colonial experience that informs everything that I do. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, Samira, do we have any final questions? We have around seven, no, six minutes. Uh, uh, we had a comment, decolonization is a politi political action, and they wanted you to tell about the role of contemporary colonizer in the practice. Mm -hmm. You want to repeat that maybe, Samira? Uh, they say the colonization is a political action and uh, they wanted you to discuss the role of contemporary colonizer in the practice. The contemporary colonizer in the practice. All right. Um, I, um, I guess looking at the political point of view um, from my standpoint and again it just a lot of my answers and perspective are going to come based on um, the the honoring of the treaties um, and looking at how that has defected our growth within um, a lot of tribal nations and to kind of put that into context within, you know, design, let's say that I do want to, uh, we have Sitting Bull College or Sintek Leshka or Ogala, Ogala Lakota College here in South Dakota. And if I were to want to add or introduce or provide, um, you know, educational partnerships or networking off the reserve off those three reservations um, it's a tough and it's challenging and to be in a position where kind of like what Leslie was trying to point on is that people kind of have this fantasized idea of what this would be and um, and kind of need to provide paint a better picture of what this can look like within here in here 2020 uh, communication arts asked me one time, you know, where, where do you see Native American graphic design in the future? And I said, you know, one day I would hope that my students can talk to Alexa in their tribal language. Or I hope one day that my students can write down their homework assignments in their own tribal calendars. Or I hope one day that um, Word, Word documents um, will, uh, you know, provide more tools that will allow my students to write essays in their um, tribal languages. And all those aspects are gonna need a designer. Um, and 
but again it's just that that wall with the you know the modern colonizer is just this this not providing space or ideas to these greater inventions that are not allowing some of these cultures to live I don't know if um, Leslie Ann or Ahmed want to add something to that. If not, we're going to start closing the panel. Uh, yes. Um, I'll take a slightly different um, approach to the question, which is I mean, I think you, you cannot segregate the political or politics from making and from research and from knowledge production. These are fundamentally linked, right? All research is political, all making is political, all made things or artifacts are political. And so if they're political, then that means that there is ethical decision making to be made there too, and that is the link between politics and ethics. Um, you know, because there is more moral responsibility on behalf of the designer. And, and the only other thing that I would say is, is that particularly with regards to knowledge and artifactual creation or making is that just as making and research and knowledge production are productive and construct things about the world, they also silence and destroy and render invisible things about the world, including communities, including other voices and so on and so forth. Um, and so we must learn to grapple with both sides of what we do, not only the constructive, but also the destructive nature or the, or the, erase, or the nature of the erasure that happens when knowledge is produced or when artifacts are made. Um, yes. So, um, you know, just more or less like a final idea that would be interesting um, to maybe mention is um, when someone wants to, let's say, get involved with this topic, uh, you have provided a few things that you read, but what is a good space to start? Like if I am a design educator that, you know, I feel, let's say, passionate about this idea, but I don't know where to start. What would be, in just a few seconds, a good first step to take? Yeah, Leslie. Um, a good first step is to, and th this isn't rocket science, everybody says this, but a good first step is to look at the references within your class um, and see how you could make that a lot more plural. Um, what are the races and, and genders of the people you're telling to your, your, your students to read? You know, who's producing the work that you're telling them to, to use? Um, so I think I would start there and, and also consciously question the power structures in the work um, and in the work that's happening in in the design studio great all right well we're gonna start wrapping up um let me just bring in a little bit here so that you can see everybody the uh, contact information of our panelists um but i'm going to be sharing that in the um in the slack channel as well so um, I'm going to stop sharing here. And I really want to just thank everyone here for um, their ideas, their passion, their motivation. This is not an easy topic, right? And it's almost utopic to think about addressing these in an hour. But, you know, we, we're really trying to bring important conversations to the table. So um, and thank you, Samira. I don't know, uh, I, I think I forgot to say that Samira is from Iran. So Samira, do you want to say something else about you? Yes, I want to say I'm really happy to be here and learn from you. It was a great experience for me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know, Alberto, we, oh yeah, we're right on time. So um, again, thank you everyone so much. Uh, I'm going to stay in touch through the channel today on Slack if you have any questions. I'm going to be sharing also all the information um, and let's just continue this conversation in some other ways. Uh, we can stay in touch and continue, continue creating a community of uh, people thinking about these topics. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for joining us.
Thank you, Gabby. We'll see you later and tomorrow. <laughs>